This is the English Suite Podcast, the voice of Widener University's English and Creative Writing Departments. I'm Chloe DeFlumeri. In this episode, Christina Giska and I are joined by Dr. Stephanie Schechner for a discussion about the work of French author Mireille Best. Dr. Schechner is the chair of the Modern Languages Department at Widener University and has undertaken the complex yet rewarding job of translating Best's novel, Camille in October, from its original French into English. This coming-of-age story centers on Camille, a working-class girl in a small coastal town in 1950s France, and her affair with an older woman, her dentist's wife. In our conversation with Dr. Schechner, we talk about the life of Mireille Best, the complex work of translating vernacular across generational and linguistic lines, and the intersections of class, sexuality, and gender, both in Best's work and across French literature as a whole. I'm Christina Geska. I am part of, or I'm a helper for the English Suite podcast that Widener produces. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and why we are interviewing you? Hi, my name is Stephanie Schechner. I am a professor of French at Widener, and I am the translator of Camille in October, a novel by the French author Mireille Best. All right. So can you just talk a little bit about the book in general? Like, what is it about? Like, what drew you to that author in particular, as opposed to any other French author? Just talk a little bit about why you decided to translate this piece. Sure. Um, So let me say that I had been um, reading and writing and thinking about the works of Mireille Best for... um, probably nearly 10 to 15 years um, before I thought about translating anything. And um, I had written a number of articles and I had been, um, I had presented at conferences about her work and I loved her work from the first time I read it for a variety of reasons. Um, I, I liked her style she writes in kind of a fragmented style, um, and she um, she has almost stream of consciousness, but it's not like a completely disembodied stream of consciousness where you can't figure out where you are. Like you know where she is in time and in space. Um, she's got a sense of humor, and. Um, she writes about lesbian characters. Um, and so there was a lot to like about her. She's also a working class author, which for me um, really resonated uh, with part of my family. And that's what made me want to translate her. Um, but I wasn't originally going to translate. I was working on her as a scholar and I was trying to get a book about her work published. And I had a really good proposal and editors kept saying how much they liked it, but the marketing departments of publishing houses were worried that it wouldn't sell because not enough people knew about her. And finally, a publisher said to me, why don't you try translating one of her books? So I thought, well, why not? And uh, so that's, that's what led me to translate her. Yeah, that's really cool. So is this author uh, like an older author? Is this author like still currently alive? So she was born in 1943, which is actually the same year that my parents were born, um, which is actually going to be relevant later. I'll get around to explaining why it's relevant. Um, sadly, um, she had many health issues throughout her life. And um, she uh, she had... Uh, Lots of health problems, but she eventually developed early onset Alzheimer's. And so in the 1990s, she stopped writing and she passed away in 2005. Um, However, 
her lifelong partner, um, Joe Crampon, is still alive. And she has been an enormous help to me as a translator. Um, so. Because uh, her, you said partner, so I'm assuming they, well, I'm not sure if it was legal for them to get married at the time. I'm assuming they didn't since you used the word partner. They, they did not get married. They could have at a certain point in France, uh, but, but I'm not sure if she was um, mentally able to be signing a legal document. When I'm a little fuzzy on the dates that France legalized marriage. Um, they were together since they were teenagers. They met in high school and they lived their whole lives together. Um, they uh, and Joe uh, read all her manuscripts and gave comments on them. Um, and she was essentially her only editor um, before she sent things to presses. The presses that published her work told me her editor at that press told me that he uh, basically did not edit her manuscripts. They took them as is. But Joe had given her feedback. Um, on everything she wrote. She didn't always agree and take the suggestions, but, um, but Joe gave her suggestions and she would take what she wanted. Um, yeah. So were the, do, does Joe speak any English or the conversations like completely in French and like how long have you been studying French if you're like fluent enough to translate a work? So I started studying French when I was uh, 12, when I went into middle school. Um, my parents had given me, my grandfather had given me a French book when I was really little, probably around seven or eight. It was a really old French book that I still have. It's falling apart. And no one in my family, I have no French heritage, but my grandfather on my dad's side and my mother and father had all studied French in school. And my grandfather encouraged me. And so I kind of wanted to be like my parents and my grandpa. And I wanted to learn French. And when I started in seventh grade, um, it turned out that I had a talent for languages. And I never stopped studying French. So I am a, a, a young 52 today, but that's 40 years of studying French. So yes, I'm fluent in French. Um, her partner know is some English, but the bulk of our com our conversations and our correspondence via email are all in French. Um, she knows some English, although she would say she doesn't. Um, but we always speak all in French and we email and I email her when I'm translating with tons of questions, not because I don't understand the word, but because sometimes the meanings are very idiosyncratic. Um, I can certainly look up the words in a dictionary, but that doesn't always clarify the meaning. Um, so yeah, it's been a long road and I would say I still make mistakes in French. I tell my students that all the time. I'm not a native speaker. Even native speakers make mistakes, by the way. Um, you all don't speak perfect English, neither do I. I don't want to, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, I had a question within the context of French literature as a whole, um, and really within the context of queer French literature, where do you think that Best's works fit in? Um, and how does French society, like how, what is the status of queer literature within the context of French literature and French society? Because we have a very like American centric view of how literature and the queer experience, and I just want you to comment on how that is different within the context of this piece and Best's other pieces. Okay, so um, Best herself uh, was writing in the, you know, she got published in the 80s and 90s, and she was heavily influenced as an author by a group of novelists called the New Novelists. These are people, a rough, uh, it's not really a school or a, uh, they were not a tightly affiliated group of writers, 
but the new novelists were all publishing mid 20th century. They had been heavily influenced by writers like James Joyce and uh, they had been influenced of course by Proust, but they were going in new directions. These authors were interested in uh, stylistic experimentation. Uh, best, it, it, so they did things like they experimented with punctuation. They experimented with stream of consciousness, with um, very erratic chronology, with sort of the erasure of characters in a traditional sense. Um, so we have French authors like um, Marguerite Duras. She was also a playwright and a filmmaker. Um, she had a strong influence on Mireille Best. Um, I would say that another author that, was, uh, ha that you can see the effect of is Samuel Beckett. So Beckett, although he was Irish and wrote in English, as an adult, he wrote the bulk of his work in French first and translated himself into English. Um, he sort of was a double refugee. You know, he had grown up speaking Irish, then the British, and you got to deal with English and the incursion, incursion of English. And then he kind of separated himself. So these writers were also very interested in questions of psychology. They were influenced by the impact of psychoanalysis and Sigmund Freud on thinkers of their period. Coming off of that, Mireille Best had a strong interest in psychology and the inner workings. What's going on during a conversation behind the scenes in our brains? What kinds of things like what kinds of little things are going on under the surface of this conversation um, where we can feel each other moving in and out or kind of clicking or not, right? Um, she, and like I said, she was influenced by experimenting with style. Um, where she fits, she was published by one of the most prestigious publishing houses in France. And she was published with no agent, with no connections. She had not gone to university. She was not part of a literary circle of people that were hanging out together. She was very outside the mainstream, but then got this uh, publishing contract. The press received her work extremely well. And her every single book has out lesbian characters in it. Okay. Now, given that, she herself said explicitly that she wanted to be seen as an author, not a lesbian author, not a working class author, not a woman author. She, uh, the, in France, there is historically resistance to the definition of communities based on identity, okay? That being said, um, she certainly was not hiding the fact that she was lesbian. Um, and um, I, I do think that one piece of why she is not that well known has to do with the fact that she was lesbian. Um, she was widely reviewed in newspapers and magazines, um, but there were a bunch of complicating factors. First of all, she was lesbian. Second of all, she was uh, somewhat reclusive, private. She also had health issues. So she couldn't always go even when she was invited to go for readings. You had the fact that she was working class and maybe didn't fit among literary people in the same ways that other authors might have. And she wasn't like a self promoter. Um, I don't know, there are lots of reasons why she's less well known. I don't think we can easily say it was just because she was queer. Um, because there are certainly more famous queer authors that are very well known. Um, right now, 
there are queer authors in France that are having enormous success and gaining followings. This author to date still does not have a broad set of people that know about her work. I'm doing everything I can to change that. Um, and translating was one piece of, of working on that. And what are some of the other pieces of working on that? And how does that fit into the context of the activism that you participate in as an individual and your involvement with the queer community on our university campus? Yeah, to me, these things are related and connected. And so I see part of my role as an ally to the queer community to be to amplify voices that are otherwise overlooked and to make sure that people hear them and can have access to them. So right now I'm in the process of planning my next sabbatical, which will be in two years from this semester, spring of 2023. One of my projects is going to be to translate another one of her books and so I think I'm going to be translating her first novel. This, this novel is her second. She had three novels and she had four volumes of short. They're called short stories, short texts. She called everything she wrote texts. She didn't call them novels. She didn't call them stories. Her editor sort of made suggestions about how they, some of them might be grouped into a single book. Um, so I want to translate this other novel, um, but the, the other project that I intend to do is to create, um, I'm, I'm working with her partner, Joe, and a friend of theirs, uh, Suzette, Suzette Robichon. She is a longtime uh, writer, editor, and activist in France, and we are working, first of all, to secure the physical papers of Mireille Best, her notebooks, her manuscripts, her unpublished work, her correspondence. And Joe has said that she wants me to have access to it, but I don't want access like here, I just put it in my basement. Um, so we are uh, working to identify a location in France where these papers can live permanently as archives. But what I would like to do is create a digital, um, some kind of digital resource where people can access these papers. So when I talked with Suzette uh, about a week ago, Suzette Robichon suggested that um, there's a platform called Hypothes, um Hypotheses that serves as a sort of a clearinghouse for academic blogs um, across English, French, Spanish, I think German, a bunch of different languages in the humanities and social sciences. And I told her I was thinking about a website and she's like, oh, website's good, but it'll be isolated. No, no one will know it exists. She said, if you do it as a blog and it connects as part of this network of blogs, more people will be able to find it and know about it. Um, she also has connected me to some groups of young queer um, activists and literary folks in France who might have suggestions for me about how to develop this blog and other people that might want to work on it with me. So Suzette, even though she is older than me, is very plugged into the young queer community in France and um, is helping me make those connections. That's so interesting, like the way that you're able to communicate with not just her partner, but these other activists. Like, I, I just find that so fascinating. And I, I, I agree, like, I think it would be very valuable to like centralize this information so that people can have access to it. Um, because that can be like a, a very big driving force behind inspiration and further work within like the queer community in France in particular um, and literature. I just, I think that's so fascinating.
you mentioned earlier you were when you were talking about translating it that sometimes the words can be very like idiosyncratic um so i was just wondering like when you translate the words do you translate the words or do you translate the meanings behind the words and is there ever anything lost in translation and how do you work with that as a translator can you also, i'm sorry yeah, but a, can you also touch on the process of translating and like what that looks like for you Sure, sure. Those are great questions. And I'd love to talk about that. And that will go back to my parents being born in 1943. So I'll, I'll, I'll circle back. So um, I had never translated anything before. And I'll, t- I'll tell you how I, how I went at it. Um, I went through and did, uh, for each chapter, I would do what I call my, my sort of ugly translation. So I do it uh, relatively quickly, and I'm going to make make the attempt to understand the language issues, right? Like, am I understanding the basic meaning? Mm-hmm. And so I'll be honest, even as fluent as I am, I look up tons of words. And um, I still, and I will fully claim this, I make mistakes. So the first person that I would have read my drafts is a fellow French professor who teaches at Arcadia uh, University locally. Um, she's a friend of mine. She is brilliant. Uh, she went to the University of California, Berkeley. Her French, in my opinion, is better than mine. She catches some of my goofy, stupid mistakes. And um, she used to teach with me at Widener before she got her job at Arcadia. This is Professor Kate Bonin. So Kate would do the first reading, keep me from embarrassing myself. And then um, I would, uh, in the course of Kate reading the thing, sometimes she and I would have disagreements. She would be like, I think this should be translated this way. And I would be like, "Mm, I don't think so. I think it needs to be this way. Because sometimes she wouldn't like my choice of words. So usually I would write to Joe to ask her for clarification about things that Kate and I disagreed on. Because I read it one way and Kate read it this way. Now, sometimes when Kate would correct me, I'd be like, oh, gosh, that's embarrassing. I made a mistake. But other times, it's like, no, I, 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 no, I don't. But if we disagreed, then I would kind of put it to Joe. Now, sometimes Joe would come back and be like, it's obvious. It should be blah, blah, blah. And I would say, um, Joe, it's not obvious. And here's an example. There was a line in the book where Mireille had written something like, everything was blue and happy and blah, blah, blah. And I, I wrote to Joe, I'm like, um, Joe, happy, like blue, everything was like a blue bird or like, like in the United States, when we say things are blue, that's not usually happy, right? Like that's, that's like singing the blues or like, I'm feeling blue. And Joe is like, it's obvious. It was her favorite color. And I was like, okay, well, that's obvious to you. But for the rest of us, that's not obvious that blue is something good. So that was one of those moments, Christina, where I had to think hard about, am I going to, am I going to translate this word for word and lose the reader? Part of me is like, you know, even in French, that might've been confusing. So maybe I do need to leave it. Um, And so you, you really have to tussle between what it literally says and trying to make something readable to someone in a different context. Now, Throughout, it occurred to me that this book is written and the characters are all working class characters who were living in northern France right after World War II. And there's a lot of slang in the book, but it's not slang from like yesterday. It's slang from like back in the day. And I wanted to try to match it with working class slang of that period, right? So I started out by, during my my last sabbatical, I started reading 
working class American fiction from different areas. And part of what I realized is that working class slang in Chicago is different than working class slang in Miami is different than working class slang in LA. Because a lot of it is like what a community is talking and how they're interacting with each other. And pre-internet, this didn't all get smoothed out where everyone talks the same. Like it was hyper local. So I was struggling with this and translating. And you kind of walk around as a translator, like, oh, I got to come up with a word for blah. And I'm like trying to think what would be the word in English, right? And I was at my dry cleaners here in Philly one day. And my dry cleaner, this woman that worked there, um, whenever you'd come in, she would be like, hey, doll, how you doing? Right. And that was just how she talked. But one day when she said it, when I left there, I could hear her saying, hey, doll. And I remembered that, well, I thought, well, gee, that's a good word for to use in the book, doll. But I also remembered that my grandmother, my mom's mom, used to call us doll. And then something clicked and I was like, oh, my gosh, like, my mom grew up in housing projects, okay? So she was really working class. Like her apartment didn't have hot water on demand when she was a kid. They didn't have a car. They, you know, she went to Catholic schools on scholarship. She, she was poor. Um, but she was also born in the same year as the author. And she grew up in a big city on the East Coast. And I was like, Yo, mom, how would you like to help me with my translation? So after Kate and after Joe went over the translation, I made my mom read the chapters. And I said to my mom, I said, I especially want you to read the passages where there's dialogue. And I want you to tell me if stuff sounds weird. Is that how people would say it when you were a kid? My dad would always be like, I can help. I'm like, you grew up rich. You are not helpful. You went to private schools. I do not want your opinion about what word to use. He's like, oh, I can help. I'm like, no. (laughs) So my mom, my mom helped. So that was a lot of my process. So let me say, go over drafts over and over and over. And then when the editor got it, He took it pretty much as is, but then he had a a copy editor go over it. And we did have a little bit of a quibble because the copy editor was awesome. And she worked with me real closely and she respected the vast majority of my choices. But then the editor, the press is located in India and the UK, and they wanted to do UK British uh, spelling throughout. And I was fine with the spelling. Like I, I was like, fine, that's fine. It's still going to sound the same, but they wanted to change certain vocabulary. They wanted to change ma to mum. They wanted to change uh, sidewalk to pavement. And I was like, I was panicking. Cause I was like, I'm not comfortable mum. Like I, my mom wouldn't have said mum. Like that's And I was going to cave because this is my first book getting published. And I was like, yeah, I guess, whatever. But the copy editor that had worked with me that the press hired stood up and said, she worked really hard to get this slang and to get a particular voice. And I don't think we should change it. And the editor backed down. And that makes perfect sense. Uh, It would have to be an entirely different translation if you wanted a context that was British compared to a context text that's American. I think that's so fascinating. And that adds so much more depth to the work that translators have to do. Because on the surface, you think, oh, there is a challenge of translating words because words don't necessarily convey the same meaning across language. But when you consider time period and slang, there's just an entirely different level that most people don't even consider. Um, And one question I wanted to ask you to follow along those lines is within the context of Camille in October, 
how does class play a role in the narrative and how does it show up in a way that shapes the characters and their experiences? Yeah, well, it's, it's at the forefront. I mean, she, uh, growing up, uh, hung out uh, in, around her mother, hanging out with her mother's friends. Some of them worked in factories. Some of them were stay-at-home moms, um, but they were all dealing with similar issues of working class women. There was never enough money. Um, men had come back from the war, if they came back from the war, um, you know, injured um, with things like PTSD. So they might have been alcoholic. They might have been very uncommunicative. Um, so these women kind of had to hold their families and communities together. Um, and uh, they, they referenced the kind of jobs that they had. I mean, literally factory work. Um, um, things like fishmongers, street sweepers, um, uh, people selling uh, fl flower sales people in the street. Um, her the the main character, the main character in the book goes to university, but um, our, you know Mire Bess did not. Mire Bess, the author. Uh, from high school, didn't sit for the exam because of health issues, worked in a plastics factory, making like waterproof clothing, like for, uh, you know, firemen and things like that. And then when her health deteriorated, she got a job working in the government in the tax services. Um, but the characters in the story, the father and the brother work in construction. Uh, the mom doesn't work, but hangs out with her friends. The, her younger sister, Camille's younger sister, runs a, gets pregnant and runs away at like 14. I'll let that register at 14. <laughs> and um, the idea of a girl getting married and having a baby at 14, 15 was not call the police. It was like, wring your hands and cry a bunch, but like, that's it. That's just life. Um, in the novel, uh, Camille has an affair with an older woman who is her uh, dentist's wife. And there's a lot of um, class friction around... Um, Camille is smart and likes books, but she's clearly not been exposed to the world of literature or people that are educated. Um, in, the, in the book, uh, Camille's mother, uh, while she might not have chosen lesbianism for her daughter, uh, she fiercely defends her daughter when other people uh, criticize her. Um, so I think the book upends our expectation that somehow working class people would be less accepting of a lesbian child. It's like, mm, no, my mom went to bat for me, at least in this book. Um, and lesbianism in the book is treated relatively matter of factly. There's not a lot of homophobia or attacks or negativity around it. Um, I mean, there's heartbreak. You're falling in love with a married woman and that's maybe not the best option, especially in this time and place. Uh, but um, yeah. So class though is there throughout. And she fiercely also, one of the lines in the book that I like the best is that she talks about the fact that working class people think and that um, all these great men of history that everyone studies that make all these big decisions that affect the little people. Um, it doesn't mean that these working class people that they don't have thoughts and ideas and voices. And she very clearly wants to align herself with those of her class who are usually shuttled off to the side, discounted. Um, I think she feels very much kind of caught in between worlds. 
That's such a, a two things from that. The, the fact of her being a lesbian being something that's treated matter of factly, I think is very important. Um, I was going to ask how much of this is autobiographical because a lot of times in literature, what ends up happening is when people write stories about the queer experience, they're almost rampantly plagued with like tragedy. There's always some sort of tragedy that is central to the narrative. And it's become a trope in, so, in um, popular culture where whenever a queer character is introduced, you know that they're going to meet some horrible end. Yeah, so it, okay. it, sorry, I didn't mean to drop. No, go ahead, go ahead. I just wanted to mention the, like, the bury your gaze trope. I, yeah. I you're referencing, but. Yeah, no, that's what it's called. It's called the barrier gaze trope. And most frequently, this is what happens with lesbian characters. So uh, it's it's almost refreshing to see that the story isn't centered around prejudice. It's centered around the human side of existing as a queer person and not just as a queer person, but as a working class person. And that was the second thing that I wanted to comment on. Um, I think that point is so important about like this idea, this misconception that working class people would somehow be more prejudiced or having money or be, having like a higher education is oftentimes conflated with being somehow a more moral indi individual. And these are just, they're complete in utter lies. They're not true. Um, so that's another way that it seems that best is resisting these ideas that I'm not familiar with French culture society, but I know for a fact are very much present within American culture and society. So yeah. there's a lot of value in translating a text like this and having people learn from these experiences that are very human and that show so much about the queer experience and the working class experiences in lights that we don't necessarily see them in America because of the own bi the, the bias that's present in our in our stories and our narratives. Yeah, I, I think the, the other thing I would point out is that she was ahead of her time in terms of thinking about the fluidity of identity. Um, not so much in this book, but in the book I'm going to work on next. Um, I've written about the fact that the representations of young women and their um, both their sexuality and how they experience friendship are quite fluid in the book I'm gonna be taking on next. And I think they align well with um, many young queer people's discussion of gender and identity fluidity. Um, but I can tell you that my experience of trying to teach this book, the first one in French at least, is that students found it challenging and difficult to read. Um, and so I would actually like to offer a little challenge to the two of you. I can offer you a copy of the book if, um, if you send me your addresses. And I'd like to know if it is as difficult to read in English as it was in French. I suspect that it is less tricky to read in English that a big piece of what my students were experiencing was like linguistic difficulty plus all that fluidity, and then it was like too much. But I think there were a lot of cool things that young people today would really resonate, that, that resistance to being boxed in, the like, I don't know who I am, leave me alone, stop asking me, like stop making me put myself in a box that she was doing, you know, decades ago that I think are very of the moment. Um, so if y'all would be my English reader. Yes, pigs. thank you so much. I really so, appreciate that. Yeah, I would, I would have to. Um, I actually, uh, do you have like a PDF of the French version of the book? Because I've actually been learning French for several years now. So I think it would be interesting to see if I could read the French version or see how much of it I could understand. Mm. So there is not a full PDF of the French version because it was published before the old PDF came along. And yeah. But um, however, it is technically still in print, Christina. So once you've read it in English, if you decide you want to try it, you can get out there and order it. To close, is there any passage or quote 
from Camille in October that you'd like to share with us? I'm just going to read a very short passage about the um, first time that Camille begins to notice Clara, her dentist's wife, in a new way. So this is a relatively short passage. I lift my eyes up again and our gazes connect. I must be staring too hard. She had an imperceptible flicker of her lashes, swiftly stilled. Again, that silent laugh, those dimples that come and go. And then she smells good, not like the mothers whose cheap eau de cologne stinks from several meters away when they remember to put some on. Me? I refuse to wear any, but maybe I stink. How would I know in spite of the soap? Very abruptly, I went to sit down on the bench against the wall. The dentist's wife comes out from behind the little counter and I see the whole dress, the fragility of her waist and the little swelling of her belly, the smooth legs without the least hair and tanned. I don't feel at all comfortable. That's so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yes, and thank you for doing this interview overall. Yeah. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. I'll be honest, I um I when when the book came out, I was so excited to get out and do readings and to start uh helping sell the book. And I I flew, I went, I went to last at January, not this past, but the one before in January, I went to London and Cambridge to do readings. My first reading was at a gay bookstore in London called Gaze the Word. Um, and I was introduced by a friend of my husband's from high school, um, whose name is now Ms. Kimberly. Um, she is a trans woman performer and activist in London. She's fabulous. And she introduced me and even sang a song, which was crazy. Um, and then I went to Cambridge and I did a reading at the public library in Cambridge and I came back to Philly and I had three things lined up and then COVID. And so it's been really sad. Um, the publisher told me that I've sold more than is average for the amount of time that's gone by, I worked it really hard, but I really appreciate you guys inviting me to, to talk and be part of this. This is a fabulous project, the podcast. I started listening to some of it and there's some really cool stuff on there. My last question was, since you were talking about like sending us a book uh, for anyone who's listening to the podcast, who's interested in getting it, uh, I was just wondering, is there any, like the full title of the book and where they could buy it if they are interested in it as well. Absolutely. If you Google Camille in October and my last name, Schechner, S-C-H-E-C-H-N-E-R, you will be directed. The first Google result will be where you can order the book from the University of Chicago Press. They are the distributors of this translation that was published by Siegel Books uh, based in Kolkata, India. Thank you so much. Thanks. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the podcast. The English Suite is produced by Jim Esch with assistance from Chloe DeFlumery, Sianna Bowers, Gabby Norris, Christina Giska, Shapresa Imarai, and Matt Lomas. You can subscribe to the English Suite at anchor.fm, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcasting applications. For more information or to send feedback, email us at wideneringlishsuite at gmail.com.